A number of years ago, already in 2000, the priest scandal came out. And people have been hitting on that ever since. And what's interesting is part of the fuel for the Fuhrer came from the media. And, you know, the subject, uh, he says in here, you know, it's, an, it's difficult to speak when there is such a grotesque imbalance of, within the media of objectivity. He talks about an article in the New York Times. And the front page of the New York Times had the priest scandal blasted across the front and the Boston priests and everything else. It said, what an atrocity this is. Gross and inhumane, called some of the priests monsters and predators and everything else. And then down below, in the lower column on the front page, they had book reviews. And in the book review, they gave a stellar review to this novel about a teacher who gives a young boy his first homosexual experience and helps him to explore his homosexual identity as he grows through puberty into adulthood. They gave it a stellar review after they talked about the monsters and predators up on the front page. And so that's what happens, the media furor. At another place, there was a, a pride parade Gay pride events also acquired dependently anti-church overtones. In 1994, a gay protest march in New York was described by horrified critics as follows. When the marchers reached St. Patrick's Cathedral, they yelled in unison four-letter epithets and pointed their middle fingers at those on the steps of the church. Some were dressed as cardinals, others as nuns and priests and many wore nothing at all. They sat down in the street, did satanic dances, and generally showed as much disrespect as they could. No one was arrested, not even those who went fully naked through the streets. Every June, gay pride marches could be counted on to produce their share of grotesquely anti-Catholic imagery. Among the flagrant attacks, were men in jock straps simulating oral sex in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral during Sunday Mass. Further, there was Catholic Ladies for Choice, a group of gays and lesbians dressed as nuns carrying wire coat hangers. There was also a man wearing a black bra and jock strap with a nun's veil and a pair of rosary beads. Another group demonstrated at the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington. The demonstration featured scantily clad lesbian crucified on a mock cross to which was affixed a sign that read, Christ loves women and queers. Why does O'Connor hate us? If that is not hate speech, I do not know what it is. There were works of art at the Metropolitan Museum at which they had a crucifix and they used phallus symbols to make a body on the cross at the base of which they had two nuns kneeling and holding wire hangers. Can you imagine if they made a work of art out of phalluses behind a barbed wire fence with a sign above that said Auschwitz? What would happen? the public outcry would be so great, something would have to give. Let alone if they had a phallus dressed as Muhammad. What would happen? Where is our passion? Because if it isn't apathy, if it's not that we're simply apathetic, it's just that we are pathetic. We do not believe what we say we believe. We do not bring a sword. We bring nothing. Nothing. Where is the outcry? Where is it? Recently, some organizations came out and said that they support same-sex unions. And by doing that, they made themselves political. 
So by doing that, they say, we are supporting this political cause. Well, as soon as you do that, you make yourself political. What are we to do? One of them, to mention a, a few, was Starbucks. Now, I like their coffee, and I frequent the establishment, or I, I'll say I did frequent the establishment. What if they had come out and said, we support marriage only between one man and one woman? I guarantee you the outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah would have been so great that something would have changed. What do we do? We do not want the discomfort of having to go elsewhere. We do not want the discomfort of not being able to buy a certain shoe, drinking a certain coffee, going to another box store to get what we need. But we must do something. Because they are making their political feelings known because these others will do something. And they are doing something. We must believe what we say we believe. We must preach it in season and out of season. And if we do that, expect to be ridiculed. Most recently, Rush Limbaugh came out with a statement and I don't listen to any of these guys because I think they're extreme too, really. But what he said in principle was true. And what he said in principle, this woman who was going to law school and unmarried was saying that insurance should pay for her birth control. And what Rush Limbaugh was saying is, you want me to, to pay for you to have sex whenever you want to. It's not an issue of being married and using birth control. This is an issue of a single person. Now, he used a very unkind word, and he shouldn't have used that. Even if it was cruel and he shouldn't have used it, he shouldn't have used it because the media grabbed that, and now the message is lost. The message is lost. All they latch on to is that that's the sound bite and includes the message, but the message is very true. We should not be paying for any of this. We should not be supporting any of this. If we are Catholic, let our yes be yes and our no be no. And as this, you know, uh, Health and Human Services Act came out, many of our Protestant brothers and sisters joined with us to say we are opposing this. And they opposed it because their religious liberty was going to be affected, just like ours. Make no mistake, though, they are not on the same page with us morally. They are not. That someone who cannot practice certain things in the Catholic Church can go to many other places and they are welcomed, if not encouraged. I do not know how that occurs, especially if they are a Bible church. The Bible is very clear. And either you use the whole Bible or you're just picking out phrases that support whatever your ministry is at the time. And so we must be strong in the faith. We cannot be embarrassed. We cannot yield to the voice of a media that is biased. We cannot. We must shout louder than they are, and we must let them see it. In the book of Revelation, it talks about those with the mark of the beast, 666. And everyone says the mark of the beast is Satan. No, the mark of the beast was Nero. Nero was the beast. And the Roman Empire was the beast. And they said this mark was on their forehead and in the palm of their hand, as in money. In other words, those who exchanged with Rome because they wanted to keep their comfortable lifestyle, because they were successful business people or whatever else, those who exchanged with Rome had that tattoo on their hand and on their forehead for everybody to see what Jesus warns about. And the same is going to happen to us. Now I'm saying some of these companies are very subtle. We might not know who they support. But when they come out and say it, they say it publicly, this is what we're doing. I know that the man at Golden, Goldman Sachs, he was questioned about this. Aren't you worried about some of your consumers? And he says, the ones who would make a fuss about this, I don't deal with any. That's what's happening. And so we must be convicted in our faith. We must believe what we say we believe. So now the other part of this, where does this come from? I think it's all rooted 
in a phrase that Jesus uses here. He says, love of money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say money is the root of all evil. That's a misquote. Some people have that on a bumper sticker or whatever. Love of money, greed. And I think greed is the source of every sin that we commit. Because we want something that we have no right to possess, but we want it. And the world will say, you can have it. Remember the three temptations. If you kneel down and worship me, all these things of the world I will give to you. And that's what we're doing. So through greed, we do this. And if you really think about it, even with Lucifer, you know, they say the initial uh, sin of his was hubris, it was pride. I think it was greed. He had everything, but he wanted to be God. He wanted more than he had been given. And whenever we cling to more than we have been given, greed is the source of that. The commandments don't have other gods before me. In scripture, whenever someone has other gods, it's because this God is not providing what I want, and this God will. Using the, the name of the Lord in vain, cursing other people, having this control over them, wanting control over them, being mad and throwing a tantrum when we don't get what we think we deserve. Not keeping holy the Sabbath day. I don't have time. And just let me do a little aside here. You know, the kids, your children, if you have them, are so good to you. They make excuses for us. Why didn't you go to Mass? Well, my parents didn't take me. But they're tired. They work so much. Or they were busy. We have so much to do. Or we have to go shopping. Or They'll make a thousand excuses because they want to protect you. Remember that when they're bad-mouthing you. They want to protect you. But it's greed. I want more time for myself, so I am not devoting an hour to God. That's it. Or I'm not hearing what I want to hear there. Or I'm not being entertained there. So I want this for me, so I'll go to the church down the street that has the coffee shop and the modern band and everything else. In fact, they have a movie screen. And they even show movies during their service. And part of the reason they do that is because they do not have the Eucharist and they got to fill up that time with something. We have everything. Everything. What more do we need? We, we have it. The sacrifice has been made. When we do not honor our parents, it is because we know better than they do. We want it our way. 